We are a planning people. Today, the elders are going to meet with the deacons and the preachers, and they are going to plan. Yesterday, even though I was not at the meeting, the elders met for several hours, and I'm assuming there was some planning that took place. Last Saturday, Brian and I met with the elders, and we planned. But we as people know that plans have to be put into action. We call them action plans, or plans of attack, or battle plans. And not only do they need to be put in action, they need to be put in action at the right time and implemented in the right sequence so that they have optimal results. I've always been impressed with how God plans. Not only how He plans, but how He puts so much emphasis on the timing of His plans. I remember reading from Exodus chapter 23 when I was a kid. And this passage is easy to skip over, but I think it's important because it shows God plans and God puts special emphasis on the timing of His plans. Exodus 23 and verse 29 says this, I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. God knew that if he had driven them out too quickly, that the wild beasts would come and start devouring the corpses. And when God's people were done killing all the people in the land, they would go back to claim their territory and the beasts would be there and they would have to fight again. It is important to plan. Maybe it's even more important to put those plans into action. And possibly the most important of all is to put our plans into action at the right time and having the patience to do it step by step, little by little, so that God is glorified. That brings us to Jesus. Jesus was resolved to follow God's plan perfectly, right down to the timing of the plan to the very end of his life. Luke chapter 3 and verse 23 tells us that Jesus was around 30 years old when he began his ministry. I can't speak for Jesus, but I can tell you, I would have probably wanted to start earlier. Tell a guy who's 20, he's got to wait 10 more years to start. Uh, I, don't, I want to start faster. Or 25. We don't know why God picked 30. It could have been that Jesus had to grow in wisdom from the time he was 12 to the time he was 30 until he was ready. It could have been that he needed some years of experience so that other people will view him as credible as a teacher. Regardless of why God waited till Jesus was 30, we have to be impressed with Jesus' willingness to wait that long before he even started his ministry. Well, at the age of 30, he started his ministry. John proclaimed him to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He was baptized in the Jordan River, and when he came out of the water, God did not lift him up, transport him to Jerusalem, open heaven while he's in the temple, and say, that's my son, listen to him. No. You know what God's plan was for the timing of Jesus' ministry after he started? Was to pause. That's right. Wait. Wait 40 days. Go into the wilderness and don't eat for 40 days and the devil is going to meet you in the wilderness and he is going to tempt you those 40 days. And when you're really, really hungry because you haven't eaten, he's going to tempt you with some stones to become bread. Matthew chapter 4 details that out. And Jesus successfully completed every one of the temptations, defeated the devil on every turn and was following God to the, to the fullest, not only the plan, but the timing of the plan. But even after that, it wasn't time for him to go to Jerusalem and do all these signs, even greater signs than Moses could perform, and tell them, I am the Son of God. You know what it was time for him to do? Pick some apostles, pick some disciples. And the disciples and Jesus and Jesus' mother find themselves not in Jerusalem, but find themselves in Cana of Galilee at a wedding. I mean, I think, why does God want Jesus to go to a wedding? He's at this wedding, and in verse 3, at the very end, Mary says to him, they have no wine. Jesus says to her, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, Mary is not deterred. She tells the servant or the deacon to do whatever Jesus says. That's good advice. Jesus tells him to fill some pots with water. Jesus does turn the water into wine. So he's respectful of his mother. He realizes the situation, but he is also very concerned about the timing of events that will eventually lead to the cross. And that concern over timing never leaves Jesus. Turn to John chapter 7. 
In John chapter 7, it's not Jesus' mother who's trying to get him to do a sign to solve a problem at a wedding and to show who he, he is, who, who she knows he is. It's his brothers that are egging him on to go to the feast so that he can be discredited and humiliated because they don't believe in him. He's not buying it. He says he's not going to the feast. He turns to his disciples and tells them they need to go to the feast. Look at uh, John chapter 7 and verse 7. It says, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going to this feast, for my time has not yet come fully. Where when he said these things, he stayed in Galilee. They went to the feast. The brothers went to the feast. And at the feast, everybody was asking, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Well, interestingly enough, the timing of Jesus going to the feast was halfway through the feast. When it was halfway through, Jesus did go and he begins teaching in the temple. And in John chapter 7, he cried out and taught. And he told him, you know who I am. And in verse 37, on the very last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, who those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus did go to the feast when the time was right. He trusted that God could take care of him and protect his timing. Not a single person laid a hand on Jesus because his time had not yet come. But brothers and sisters, God be glorified and Jesus be honored because when the time did come, our Savior was ready. Turn to Luke chapter 9. We're going to read, start reading in verse 43 in just a minute. In Luke chapter 9, we have another lesson about the timing that Jesus was so concerned about. Early on, a man brings his son to Jesus' disciples. He's, he has a demon, and they, he wants the demon cast out. The apostles can't cast it out. Jesus hears what's going on. He comes over. The whole thing is explained to him. Jesus ends up casting that demon out. They couldn't do it because of a lack of faith. And as a result of that, I want you to put yourself in the moment. Put yourself there and just let these words soak in. Jesus is just cast a demon out of a little boy. And the Bible says this, And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But you know what? Jesus knew that it was not time to sit around and be amazed at the majesty of God. In verse 44, he tells his disciples, Let these words sink down deep into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. Don't get caught up in this. But they did not understand this saying. They were hidden from him, and they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Jesus knew the importance of following God's law perfectly. And he knew that people are going to get sidetracked with timing. You're going to think the time is now, and it's not now. Now is not the time for us to bask in God being glorified over this event. Now is the time to turn our attention to what God has in store for us, for me to be offered up for the sins of the world. As a matter of fact, in verse 51, it says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was determined at this very critical moment to go to Jerusalem. The timing was now, and Jesus was ready. In John chapter 12, after he enters Jerusalem, this triumphal entry, and everybody is calling him, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In verse 23, Jesus answered them and said, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. In verse 27, it says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Jesus goes into the upper room, and he establishes this very memorial that we are taking right now to remember Jesus by taking the bread and taking the fruit of the vine. After this meal is over, as they make their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus spoke these words in John chapter 17 and verse 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, and your Son may also glorify you. 
in verse 4. He says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus says, the time is coming to an end. I have finished all the work that you have given me to do. And then in Mark chapter 14, after they make their way to the garden and Jesus finishes up the prayer in the garden, he says to his disciples in verse 41 of Mark 14, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. The time is now. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The time was right. And when the time was right, Jesus was ready. And Jesus fulfilled his ministry perfectly in the perfect time. So much so that while Jesus was hanging on that cross, he knew when his life was to end. In John chapter 19 and verse 28, the Bible says this. After he had said to John, Behold your mother, to his mother, Behold your son, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished and the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. He knew the timing was done, but he knew there was something else he had to say. So he said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. God's plan, God's timing, being carried out perfectly by God's Son. If Jesus had come on the scene and instantly told everyone who he was and what the plan was, the plan would have been in jeopardy. The fact that Jesus spoke the words of the Father, taught the commands of the Father, and performed His Father's work at the exact time and in the perfect way to have optimal impact and ultimate success stands as a tribute to an obedient Son and a wonderful Savior. The Savior that we honor right now who was determined and resolved to follow God's plan and fulfill it in God's time. Praise be to God that He did exactly that.